You're listening to the Business and Life Podcast, where seven days a week, proven entrepreneurs share their success stories, failures, and give you true value on how you can build a great business and an awesome life with your host, Mike Olivas. Christina, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. Absolutely. Thanks for taking the time. So tell our listeners uh, something interesting about yourself. Um, I guess something interesting in the moment is I have a newborn back there behind the store. If you're watching oh, the video, <laughs> who is crying? No, no, no. He's crying. He's not happy. He cries. <laughs> he's not being held. Oh, and yeah. I am trying to run a business, so I can't hold him all the time. So that's I, the new yeah. interesting thing. Is I, I have. Know, I feel his pain. I have the same issue. That's probably why I'm single. <laughs> <laughs> so that so he needs the attention. I get it. Yeah, so that's the interesting thing happening okay. right now is trying to run a business from home with three kids, one of them being a newborn. How old is he? He is, right now he's seven weeks. Well, congratulations on the newborn. That's awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. Sounds like you have a great family. And so you um, are in South Florida, like we talked about earlier. And tell uh, our listeners a little bit about what your company does. What kind of value does it bring to the marketplace? Yeah, so yeah, I'm in South Florida. I'm outside West Palm Beach. Um, nice. And what I do is I help business owners get attention and earn exposure in the media without spending any money on ads. Um, I actually have no background in PR and I own a PR agency and this all came about because wow. my background is in TV. So I was a reporter and anchor for over 10 years. And when I was in that business, I was being pitched all day, every day by business owners, but mostly publicists and people at PR agencies. And it was very evident that they did not work in the media. They had no idea what it was like working in a newsroom, how we put together stories, how we decided what we were gonna cover, how we covered it. Um, so all of their pitches were pretty bad. Um, so when I was getting out of news and I wanted something a little bit more flexible, I got into PR and I worked at an agency for about six months before starting my own. Awesome, and so tell me what you felt, like how did you feel there was a need for this? Obviously people create, uh, a product or a service based off of, wow, I can, I can really see a need for this. What was that kind of aha moment for you? Yeah, well, a couple of things. Yeah. One, from my perspective, being on the receiving end of receiving all of these press releases or pitches, yeah. they were all bad. Like you need somebody who is actually covering the news to tell you how to pitch the news to be a part of it. A lot of people were missing the mark. So that's why I thought, okay, hey, I can do this job, but I can do it better than how most people are doing it because I have an insider's perspective. From the business owner's perspective, one, it's great because you're not spending money on ads. So you're saving money because ads can get pretty pricey. And two, more people are actually paying attention to content when you earn it. Like think of your own behavior. Most people skip through the Google ad results and go straight to the organic. When you're watching TV, you fast forward through the commercials. When you pick up a newspaper or a magazine, you wanna read the content, you don't wanna look at the ads. So I help people earn that exposure organically without spending money so more people pay attention to it. So you get that credibility and you get that authority because with ads, you also don't get that either. So it's a long-term strategy. It doesn't happen overnight, but it is slowly but surely building a brand if you're consistent with it. I think that's great. That's a great point. And I, and I mentioned this a lot too. I'm big into the marketing world and I've, I've had to evolve into that and, and teach myself the, the Facebook and Instagram, you know, platforms and the Twitters and the LinkedIn's and then the Snapchats and understand those in and out and watch countless YouTube videos, right? On how to do these things. And in, in, in hindsight, I think a lot of people from a branding perspective and or SEO perspective, that organic approach is simply organic, thus so much more valuable, right? And, and I always, for example, the Google AdWords, I, I always say Google ads are gonna win the game across the board in the advertising platform because the very simplicity of it is that Google is your idea, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, you're creating the idea, you're trying to create the idea for them. Google is like, they actually search for it. Right? They're searching for something and they're interested. But I love that, the, that you mentioned something that I kind of talk about a lot too is that I really feel like peer-to-peer -peer marketing and organic marketing is making a huge comeback. It's almost like you know, high pants on women that are wearing that's came and came back from the 80s. Right? People started <laughs> wearing that and it's like, where did that come from? It's like we're just starting to recycle things that we used to work. Well, this used to work and it still does work. And in fact, I think that, and you, might, you may or may not agree with me, but, and I'd love to chat, hear, hear your thoughts on it, but 
we're so blinded by advertisements now that it's, it's like, I don't even look at it. Whether somebody is on Instagram, Facebook, or swiping left and right on Twitter, they're seeing ads. And, and it's not a, um, it's almost like you don't even, it's second nature to not even look at them anymore. And that, and that's a kind of a point that you're trying to make. Is that right? Yeah, totally. Because when you see an ad, you know that somebody is just paying to be there. There's no authority. There's yeah. no credibility. You don't know if they're good or if they're bad. Like, you know, they're paying to be there. Right. So you just want to go straight to the organic. Um, and I think the stat is, and it's increasing. It's almost 90% of people when they Google something, they will go past those yep. first two or three ads and go straight to organic because you know that person deserves to be there. They worked hard yep. to get there. So they're probably good at what they do. Right. You don't get that when you see an ad. But I feel like so many people, they go to ads because it's quick, it's easy. You just pay for it and you're there. Right. And it's guaranteed. Sure. When it comes to earning coverage and, you know, getting at the top of Google, that's going to take a lot of work and that's a long-term strategy. Right. And we live in this world today where people want results like this. Even if you tell them nobody's going to pay attention to their ad, they say, oh, I don't care. I know it's going to be there. And right. they're not thinking, they're not thinking the, the right way. They're just thinking yeah. instant gratification, not necessarily brand building over a long period of time. And that's a great point. I think that, you know, it's, there's a value to different, to both of these, right? If you're a sales minded organization, sure. You can go on there and play the numbers game. You're going to pay a lot of money for it. You just are. And it's getting more and more expensive. Um, very a lot more expensive, right? And so cost per lead, cost per leads, cost per acquisitions and understanding what that value is, a value per lead, all those things that I've done businesses and I help others do from a consulting standpoint is realizing, yeah, that's a numbers game. You can play that game, but the long-term game really needs to be the organic approach because if not, you're going to pay that all the time, right? And you never, and so I'm wondering, do you feel and in your, in your expert opinion, Five, just five years ago, for example, pe people probably didn't realize what was sponsored and what wasn't, right? And, and do you think everyone now, today, you know, even 10 years later after a lot of the booms of the advertising world and, and, and just especially social world advertising, do you think everyone now pretty much is aware as a general consumer, not business people that are probably listening to this, but their clients and their, their people that are trying to convert, do you think they're all aware that, yes, this is an advertisement, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram or Google? Yes and no. Yeah. Yes on things like Google ads or Facebook ads or Instagram ads, like we have learned. But no, because people, and by people, I mean people running these media outlets, they're getting more creative. They know people aren't paying attention to those ads. So they're hiding the advertisement and they're not being completely transparent about telling you it's an ad. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Yeah. Um, when you watch the Today Show or you watch Good Morning America, and they do a steals and deals segment where they're sharing all these products and telling you, go to our website and get these products. What you don't know is that those products are giving some of their money to the Today Show. They're giving of some of that money to the host. Product who placement. Is, right. The host who is putting the segment together. And then you also have to heavily discount your item or your product to get that placement. Um, Damn it, another, Hoda. Yes. <laughs> Another example is the Forbes Coaches Council. So many people have told me, um, and I was actually invited to do this years ago to yeah. write for Forbes. And I write for a lot of different, a lot of different um, outlets. I write for Inc., Fast Company, Boss Babe. Um, so I was like, oh yeah, cool. I'll write for Forbes. And they said, okay, well, this is how much it costs. And I'm like, wait, I have to pay yeah. you to write for you? And they were like, oh, yes, this is the coaches council. This is the way it works. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm not paying you to write for you. So that's, that, in a sense, is an advertisement. Can, but isn't that people, wild? People do it. So many people I do know. it. And they feel really special and important because they say, I write for Forbes. But they leave that part out where I pay Forbes to write for them so I can tell you I write for Forbes. Yeah, of course. If you're paying to play, and, and, and I know there's going to be listeners listening to this to do this. And, that's, and I'm not going to knock it up to the point where, like, you understand what your instant gratification is, but at some point you got to look in the mirror and say, where's my value? And if my value is paying someone to give them my skill set, look back and realize that you can do that by lo most likely, you know, keep doing what you're doing, get better at what you're doing and create more content like that will happen. However, 
the pay to play thing and good for you to say kind of like no, put your foot down and say no that's not that's not what i'm going to do i'm not going to pay you to write for you <laughs> that's pretty and wild. there's a lot of things that they don't tell you about the forbes coaches council they don't tell you that a lot of that stuff is not indexed and they don't tell you that oh, really? a lot of those yes and a lot of those links that you share are no follow and once you write for the council you can never become a regular contributor on Forbes because then it's a conflict of interest. So like I would say, don't jump on be, don't jump on the pay to play opportunity instead work strategically for six months and then get it organically. Patience. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's what next, people don't have today. Next time. Yeah, no, they don't. It's, it's definitely a virtue. I had, a, I had to really learn, learn that. And it honestly probably was only over the past few years to really learn the value of patience but next time a plumber comes by to my place i might be like hey here's a bill for you know fifty dollars to fix you know my sink <laughs> let's, see how that, let's see how that works out so give me um give me a time so you've done the entrepreneurship journey for a while here give us a time i love to ask questions about hitting rock bottom a story where you may have been close to it and or was at rock bottom and was able to overcome that challenge christina I don't know if I would call this rock bottom, but I feel like there's a lot of ups and downs throughout your journey. Like literally, I can tell you in the last three weeks, I had such a high where it's like, oh my gosh, this is my biggest month yet. And my team is amazing and we're all jiving. And then literally the next week, you have like two clients that aren't the nicest or aren't the easiest to please. And they just make you hate working with people and you're like, why do I do this? I don't want to do this anymore. Or you have a team member who slips up and, and then you don't want a team anymore. You just want to go back to being um, a freelancer and you don't want to build a team and have this business. So I feel like yeah. rock bottom happens. Like it could happen like once a month just yeah. because of everything <laughs> around you. And, and I thank goodness I have a good um, community of other business owners and I mastermind and I have business coaches and they're like, no, 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 this is normal. It's normal to hate your business and want to totally get out of it and quit. <laughs> right. And then the next week be very happy with it and want to grow it. <laughs> oh man, we are all emotional roller coasters. Yeah, we sure, we sure are. And, and you're right. And it's, it's normal. It's normal. And it's, I guess um, I've had, you know, uh, clients and, or people that I, I coach and help out with entrepreneurship and, and I'm not, you know, I'm always learning. Uh, but I think if there's something that I've learned, it's, you know, the stress doesn't go away. You just, you just get really, you get a lot better at dealing with it. You yeah. build a callous shell around your entrepreneurship business and life and learn how to take the bullets versus dodge them every time. Um, and that's, that gets easier and easier. So, you know, your mindset is a little bit more um, less or less stressed, I guess, if you will, on a day to day. So you've gone through a lot of these journeys and got a lot of these hurdles or I call them, you know, obviously the business speed bumps. What do you think, why, or why do you think uh, many entrepreneurs out there, Christina, just quit? That's a good question. I think a couple of reasons. One is they, they don't learn how to handle the stress, like what you were talking about, um, because it can be very stressful. And yes, you do need to learn how to handle it. You need to realize like what matters and what doesn't matter. You know, like it's not about people pleasing. I think that was a big problem yeah. with me starting out. Like I wanted to please all of my clients. Um, and this is what, this is a good thing about contracts, right? Like you say what you're going to do. <laughs> my contract is in writing. Yeah. yeah it, my contract isn't to get you to like me. It's not to people please you right. It's to do this, this, and this. Um, so I think the people pleasing, like there are some people or some clients who cannot be pleased no matter what you do. And you can let that drive yourself so crazy that you quit. Yeah. Um, and then I think there is the misconception and it is such a misconception that having a job is steady income yeah. because we all know that when you start a business, your income is like this, it's up and down, it's up and down until you learn how to grow it and maintain a steady level to where you feel comfortable. But until you get to that point, you probably think that, oh, I'll just get a job because every two weeks I am guaranteed this paycheck. But at the end of the day, you're working to make somebody else money. They don't care about you. They don't care about your family. Right, right. If you stop making them money, they're going to get rid of you. Um, and if something happens in the industry, in the world, they could still get rid of you. So while you think that's steady, it's not. Like right. you have to be in control of how much money you make because nobody cares about your family or 
whatever you're making money for as much as you do. No, so, absolutely. but I, I do think there is that misconception that having a job means having a steady income. And that's why people, that's why people quit. And then a third reason, if I could have a third, <laughs> please, please do. No, that's great. It's very hard at the beginning. I know the first, I would say year and a half of me working my business, I was working like 12 hour days, seven days a week. And a lot of that was because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So I was going through a lot of trial and error and I wasn't investing in a coach because I didn't understand that yet. And I had a bad money mindset. I didn't want to spend money that I wasn't making to build my business. But once I spent the money and I invested in somebody who actually knew what they were doing and they could tell me and I could cut out that trial and error and I could work less hours and make more money, then I was working less and I was working towards something. I could actually see a more consistent revenue and a consistent income. But at the beginning, it is crazy amount of work yeah. for not a lot of return. So you have to be willing to work a bunch of hours for a few years to mess up, to not make consistent income for the end goal. And I think a lot of people, they try that for a few months. It's not happening as fast as they want right. and they quit. Life Nation, we're all striving towards different goals. Maybe your goal is to finally quit the 8 to 5 time. Quit your job or take the you know, next step with your existing business. Whatever the goal may be, regardless of your reasons, if you are serious about taking the next step and finally trying to build the life that you deserve, the life that you want to live, take the leap of faith with you. Go to michaellevis.com and let's discuss your goals and life. It's 100% free. There's no obligation. It's M-I-K-E-O-L-I-V-A-S. Dot com schedule a quick call i'd love to help you're right i think that's what i think the impatience thing comes back into play of why people might quit you're right and you, you mentioned a few things about just understanding you're going to work your ass off and just go yeah. into it knowing that but you know knowing that it's, it's a, such a learning process right so listeners if you're an aspiring entrepreneur or if you are already an entrepreneur and something that Christina really mentioned that I want to touch on as well that I think was a great sound bomb that kind of goes into if you're a service-based industry and a lot of people that are listening are um, you have to create that SOW if your standard if you're if your statement of work is not very specific you're gonna have a lot of nightmares with your customers and clients right so and, and obviously you've done something like that where listen here's what I do you talked about contracts right here's what I'm gonna do and it's so much more um, it just feels really good you're gonna go to bed at night knowing exactly what you can deliver and feel very confident about what you're gonna deliver and nothing less and nothing more in fact you can you can definitely under promise and over deliver but you already know that that's your statement of work so if you can find a way to turn your service into that kind of product, and I'm, if you're watching, I'm quote, quoting product, turn the service into a product, you can scale that. You can scale a product service, if you will. And so, Christine, like you mentioned, like some people want to quit because a lot of times they're probably getting a lot of earfuls of just why aren't you doing this? And then they have the hands and, or they have the, the, the weight of other, so many different businesses on their shoulders now, but it's might possibly because they didn't create that SOW, that statement of work very specific. Here's what I do. Here's when I do it. Here's the milestones and know it and do it day in and day out and get really good at those key core things versus trying to be like you mentioned everything to everybody, right? Cause you're not Nutella. You're not Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Two very different things. <laughs> I know, but I love Nutella and that's everything to me. So. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what you're thinking about in terms of what's exciting for you right now in your business. Um, well, what's exciting for me because I have learned patience and I'm not in a hurry um, to do all of the things. I'm actually creating something right now. Um, it is going to help people who want to become more guests on podcasts. Oh, cool! Um, as you and I both know, um, podcasts are blowing up like crazy, um, yeah. and since I work in all forms of the media, I can tell you firsthand and from my client's perspective that it's where you see the quickest ROI. Yeah. You know, you can be on TV, you can be quoted in an article, um, you can be on the radio, but there is something about people who listen to podcasts who are very invested in themselves, are very invested in their business. So people are seeing the value of not only having a podcast, like you and I both have podcasts, but being a guest on podcasts. So um, as you know, you can go to um, Apple Podcasts and you can look for ones you want to be a guest on, but there's no easy way to find podcasts, 
how to pitch them, who to pitch. So I am in the process of working with um, a website developer to create some software that will make it easy for people to find podcasts and pitch them to be guests. Awesome. Awesome. Is that going to be a membership platform? Yes, it'll be subscription it. based. Yeah. Yeah. There's some that exist like this already, but they don't have podcasts. They have TV, they have radio, radio they have magazines, yeah. they have newspapers, right, but they do right. not include podcasts. So I'm going to create the podcast version of that. Awesome. So if you're listening and you're afraid of some of the steps of having a podcast, there is a lot of work involved. And that's where I'm assuming, obviously, Christina sees that and says, how can we solve this problem? Right. And that's, that's huge. I think that'd be awesome um, in terms of being able to get people on the podcast or, and vice versa, get on one and also get interviews. Cause it's not easy. Sometimes you got to go and knock on several doors and find scheduling. And that's a process. I have a virtual assistant who's great and helps me out on a daily basis. Um, and going back to your point of seeing, you know, no value of, in, you know, doing this for, I can do this for six months, eight months, and maybe not have an ROI, but the long-term effect is definitely going to be there. And that's what's exciting about me. Plus I love to do it. It's great to meet people um, and that I can learn from as well. So you're currently, you know, in a, um, in a specific like demographic, tell me a little bit what media Maven is, is focused on right now. Yeah. So we provide two different services. One of them is media relations. So we will literally pitch the media to get you coverage. Um, a couple of examples, we have a client right now going on um, CNN's headline news tomorrow to talk about his expertise as it relates to school safety. Okay. Um, his business is um, Safe Hiring Solutions, where they just make it safer um, for oh, you good. to be in schools and businesses um, and places of worship through the technology that they use. And he's going on on an anniversary of a mass shooting to talk about school safety and how um, we can make schools safer. Um, so again, he is going to be in front of millions of people on CNN's headline news, talking about his business, talking about his expertise, and he's not paying a dime to be there. Um, and we've been working with him for six months and this is the first time we've got him that. So he understands the importance of building a brand. I mean, obviously we've gotten him other things throughout the, the course, last six yeah. months, but nothing this big. So that's what we do. That's, that's, that's a perfect huge. example of what we do. Um, and then in addition to that, it's important to be putting out your own content to drive traffic to your websites. So we work with clients on SEO focused blogging, um, not blogging for the sake of blogging, because we all know we should have blogs on our website, but we actually look at what keywords people are searching, how many people are searching those keywords and how many results there are. Um, because you don't want to compete against something that has 10 billion results. You're never going to show up on the top of Google. Nobody's ever going to find you. Right. So the goal is to find that needle in a haystack. So a lot of people are searching for this topic. You're an expert on this topic, but there's not a lot of results for it. So let's, let's focus on this to try to get traffic to our website. And, and the two work very well together um, because you get those backlinks when you're featured in the media. Um, which helps with your SEO. So we, we use both of those together to build your brand organically again. Well, if there's a listener um, wondering right now, like I'd love to reach out to Christina, but um, the patience thing is getting to them. They're wondering how long does it take, right, to get some kind of results? Have you created any kind of historical data or average on like you're going to get an ROI X or is it very much a uh, situational when it comes down to like how many people are actually searching for this, et cetera. Do you have an answer for something, someone like that? It is so different. So is SEO it? wise, SEO wise, I would say at least three months to mm -hmm. see anything. Um, but when it comes to earning media, like I've had a client sign one week and by the end of that week, they're on the front page of the newspaper. Um, yeah. And then I've had a client sign and it'll take a few weeks or even a couple of months to see something. And that all relates to just, it's news, right? Like you have to pay attention to the news cycle and things that are happening. Like I have a client now that is government focused. Yeah. And when we pitch, you know, everybody's talking about the impeachment. Mm -hmm. So if, unless your business has something to do with the impeachment, you're not going to get coverage because right. all those journalists are covering that topic now. So it really just depends um, and this is where it's important again, to have somebody who has that news background, who understands what it takes to be in the media so they can tell you, okay, look, this is going to work this time of year. We'll pay attention to this industry and 
and what's happening in your niche or in the trade outlets, for example. Um, but yeah. it all goes back to also like being realistic. Sure. Um, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said, oh, great, I'm going to hire you because I want to be on Good Morning America and I want to be on Oprah's Super Soul Sunday. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's what everybody tells me. Yeah. And guess what? You don't even have like one piece of local news coverage. So they're going to laugh when it's they Google you and they see then. nothing. So you're saying it's a build-up approach like anything else. you got to build some hype around the brand, the service, the product that you're pitching for them on a daily, weekly, monthly basis through the different outlets and obviously your secret sauce that you do so, but it just takes time to get the big dog. You can't expect to get on you the, the Good Morning America out of the gate. Right. And it can happen, but I would say yeah. it happens like that 10% of the time, 90% of the time, like these people are going to Google you. Like what are they going to find when they Google you? Or is right. there going to be other, other media outlets sharing your expertise and your story? If not, then you have to start small and work your way up. That's the best way to do it. What is uh, media, earning media? What exactly would that entail for someone that doesn't understand uh, PR world? Yeah, so it's, it's based like it's earning it. Um, so there's owned yeah. media, which is what you own. You put stuff on Facebook. You put stuff on your website. Like you're in control of that. There's paid media, which is paying for an advertisement. And then earning media, it's like you work your tail off to earn it. Like you say, Mike, I should be on your podcast and this is why I should be on your podcast because your audience cares about this. I can talk about that and we're a great fit. Like I'm working hard to get on your podcast. I am yeah. earning it and I'm not spending any money to be there. So that's what earning media is. It's what most people think about when they think of public relations or PR. And I will say a lot of times when you pitch, people will come back and they'll say, oh, well, I'm going to charge you for that. And I'm like, oh, okay. Now you're trying to sell me an advertisement. So you have to if, if many times I'll be like, nope, I don't, I don't do ads. So next move on to the next. And sometimes I'll say, okay, well, let me take this back to my client. Please let me know why we should purchase an ad from you. Like, what are your numbers? What can my client to expect? What is the ROI? That's when you start asking the ROI questions is when somebody's selling you an ad. Yeah. If you're earning media or you're, you know, active on social or you're, um, you know, putting those blog posts out on your website, it's hard to see an ROI because you're building a brand. So when people ask me what their ROI is going to be, I'm like, I can't tell you that. Like yeah. I can get you in, in a variety of places at a variety of different times and millions of people can see you, but I don't know what they're going to do after they see you. Like, right. and if they go to your website, like what if your website's down? If they yeah. call you, what if the person who answers the phone is a jerk? Yeah, you know what exactly. I mean? Like I, I can't control your ROI. I can just get you visible. I can right. get you the leads. Like, I can lead the horse to water and you make the horse drink the water. That's right. That's right. You can create the impressional value and it's up to their system processes, sales to, to make sure they convert. That makes sense. Yep. hundred percent. So my, one of my main questions I like with the, with the whole environment of business and life podcast, how are you currently, I mean, you're at, you're at home right now doing this yep. podcast. You have your baby in the back there, hopefully. Still crying. Oh, this is still crying. Sorry. Yep. And <laughs> beautiful home. I mean, building the life that you want to live and using the business to do it. What, how are you currently or how have you built the life that you want to live with your business? Well, I mean, you just said it. Like I'm sitting at home working. Yeah. Like this, and this is how I have designed my business. And I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Some clients are turned off by it. Sure. Um, and I think they need to like get with the times. Yeah. Um, my yeah. whole team, I have a team of eight and they're all independent contractors. Mm -hmm. We all work from home. We all make our own schedule. Um, because at the end of the day, all I need is this laptop and Wi-Fi to do my job. And right. I don't want to have the expense or headache of an office. I don't want to limit myself to employees within like a 20 mile radius to drive to me. I want to work with the best of the best. And if you yep. live in New York city and you're amazing, then I want you on my team. Right. Um, and this is just the way the world is going, especially in the United States. Um, if you look at the, the freelancer statistics, it's growing like crazy. And that's because people want freedom. They don't want to go into an office and have a boss act like they need to babysit them. Now, I'm not going to lie. Some people need that, right? Like some people need to go into office and like have their feet held to the fire every day. Um, if you're that person, I don't want you on my team. I want yeah. people who are self-sufficient. That's right. Um, but I mean, as long as you get the job done, I don't care where you are. I don't that's care right. what you're wearing. I don't care what time you're doing it. That's right. And that's how I work. That's how people on my team work. And we 
we can charge a little less than the average PR agency because we don't have those expenses That's right. and we can deliver better results because we're working in a better environment. That's great. I think that's a great point. And for those listening that are entrepreneurs and or aspiring that are thinking about how do I, do I have to go get an office in a brick and mortar? No, uh, you're a testament to that, Christine, and my companies are a testament to that. Like I moved to Puerto Rico on the, on a whim, if you will. I came here for seven days and never went back just to check it out and never went back. But the, I, and I had office and I had offices by the way. So I had to go and ask my, the employees, quote unquote employees that I had at that point that are not contractors, but you're absolutely right. Then I got some people in Miami because the best of the best is possible when you don't have to have someone like you mentioned in 20 mile radius, that is such a big upsell for those that are looking for a PR agency. Think about like how, what Christina just said. I mean, that's a huge, um, a huge angle that people don't understand when they might feel better while talking to someone that might be behind a pretty looking desk. Like uh, that, that doesn't matter. It's results, result driven. And if you're able to do it and think outside the box like that, I think it takes more guts and more potential. It has more potential for someone doing what you're doing versus someone sitting in an office in my two cents, because you, you do have that ability to go and get some of those skill sets. So if you are to give one more, let's say one piece of advice for our listeners um, as a pardon piece of advice here, Christina, what would that be for the current and or aspiring entrepreneur? Um, I think the biggest thing that holds people back is they're afraid to take risks. Um, so many people think it's working smarter instead of harder, which yes, that's important. But until you take the risk to actually do it, you can't work smart or hard. Yeah. Um, and you know, we all hear those stories of like, you see something on Amazon. It's like, Oh, I had that idea five years ago. Yeah. Like my, my husband did this the other day with like, like when the kids fall asleep in their car seat and their heads, like you all should be watching <laughs> right. their heads, like turn into like a bobblehead and they're like this. Yep. He was like, we need like a strap to like hold them in. So their heads stay. <laughs> He's been saying this for years. And I just bought that contraption on Amazon the other day. And he's like, oh, that was my idea. I'm like, yeah, and you did nothing with it. Right. Because to spend the time and money on something, not knowing if you're going to be successful with it, that's risky. Yeah. And, and that, I think, is what holds people back. And they have to be willing to take a risk. Like, you got to listen to podcasts. You got to read whatever books you got to read to get out of that mindset to take a risk. And that's why, you know, the business owners get paid so much like look at the the owner of i don't know macy's for example <laughs> he probably makes a lot of money sure. and that's because he took a risk to start macy's that's right. um and and i think that's that's what it is it's not necessarily who is the smartest it's not who has the best idea it's not who works the hardest it's who is willing to actually take a risk and go all in yeah who's who's willing to take that risk and stick with it in the long haul and, and you're absolutely that. Without great risk, I think it was JFK. Without great risk, there's no great reward. And so thank you for the knowledge, but I love the risk one because we haven't used, I haven't heard that one in a while. And I absolutely agree with that. I had that poster in my office when I used to have an office. Um, and so <laughs> <laughs> thanks again for being on the show, Christina. And I appreciate that. Where can people find you? Thank you. Um, I am active on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me there at Christina all day. And my site is media maven and more.com. And I help, I have tons of free resources on there that will help people learn how to pitch the media to get publicity and turn it into profit. Um, if your audience is interested, I have a free three day video class that teaches them that I share an exact pitch that got somebody on TV in San Diego. Yes. Um, so you can literally take that copy, paste it, make it your own, and you can get that at pitchpublicityprofit.com. Perfect. And if you guys want to check out the show notes, you can get all that information there at michaelevis.com. And you can just Google uh, or in our search bar. I'm sorry, Christina Nicholson. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. Life Nation, you've got to remember that in order for things to change, you must change. And in order for things to get better, you must get better. You just got better by hanging out with me, Michael Lebus, and the Business and Life Nation. So come back tomorrow because I'm here dropping sound bombs seven days a week, baby. If you'd like to subscribe, please do so you can take action and execute. See you tomorrow.